the third of five in our series, uh, UW Engage Science. We are so pleased to be able to offer this platform to these students and their in, in engaging work. As we get underway, I would like to acknowledge that our institution stands on the unceded traditional territory of the Coast Salish people, particularly the Duwamish. We thank them for our continued use of the natural resources of their ancestral homeland. Thank you all so much for tuning in. Town Hall is proud to be a community focused organization and a place where we can share and sustain ideas and creativity, even if it means we can't gather in person. I'd like to thank our speakers for appearing tonight to help make that possible. Tonight's broadcast is also streaming to our Facebook and YouTube pages. For viewers who would like to watch this broadcast with closed captioning, we recommend viewing the program via our YouTube page. The video will be available for rewatching immediately following tonight's broadcast. Town Hall and the nonprofit community at large have been put under significant strain due to COVID-19. Uh, we hope you would consider extending your generosity if you're able to help support us during this difficult time by making a donation or become a member. Town Hall's work is made possible through your support and the support of our sponsors. Our Arno Matulski Science Series is supported by Microsoft, KUOW, the Winkle Foundation Northwest, and the Taxpayers of Washington. Finally, Town Hall is a member-supported organization, so I'd like to thank all of our members watching tonight. Tonight's program will include three separate presentations with a time for questions at the end. Each presentation is about 20 minutes long. You can submit questions anytime using the Ask a Question field at the bottom of your screen. If you can be sure to address the question to the presenter you intend it for, that would be greatly appreciated. We can't guarantee that we'll get to every question, but we will try to get to as many as possible. And now I'd like to introduce our first speaker. Megan Garrett is a PhD student in the Molecular and Cellular Biology program at UW. She studies the immune response against HIV in infected mothers in order to better understand antibodies that might have protected their infants from infection. The goal of this research is to use these findings to help improve HIV vaccine design. Please join me in welcoming Megan Garrett. Okay. Um, well, I'm really excited to talk to everyone today about how moms and babies could help uh, potentially uh, make a better vaccine for HIV. And so um, in the same year that we figured out that AIDS was being caused by a virus, researchers very optimistically came out and said that we hope to have a vaccine against this virus within two years. However, that was 36 years ago, and today we are nowhere near getting a successful HIV vaccine. While we don't have a vaccine, what we do have is antiretroviral therapy, which is great. And antiretroviral therapy has averted um, many deaths, as you can see in red here on the chart. Um, but still, many people are dying due to HIV. And while this uh, pandemic may not be in the news as much as a certain other pandemic right now, um, there is still a great need for an HIV vaccine. So with other viruses, the path between discovering the virus and deploying a vaccine has been relatively straightforward using a few tried and true methods. Um, however, like I said, it's been 36 years since the discovery of HIV and we're not close to a vaccine yet. And so I'm gonna talk about why these tried and true methods have not worked for HIV and what makes HIV so difficult. So, you know, we're gonna talk a lot about vaccines today. So first let's talk about what is a vaccine. Um, so a vaccine is usually uh, either a weakened or partial version of a virus. And you give this to a person and, and first, at first their immune system won't recognize it, but then it'll realize, oh, this is a pathogen and I should attack it. Um, and that way the next time when your body sees the real thing, it'll know to immediately go into attack mode. And so one way that you can make a vaccine is just by taking the whole virus and inactivating it. And um, what I mean by inactivating is usually either heating it up or adding some chemicals. And an inactivated vaccine is actually what we do for the flu virus. So why can't we do this with HIV? Um, it turns out there's one major reason, and that is because using an inactivated virus vaccine is just too risky. 
So um, when you make an inactivated virus, there is an absolutely teeny, teeny, tiny, small chance that you could accidentally give someone the real disease if you don't happen to inactivate it 100% completely perfectly. And I wanna emphasize that this almost never happens, but of course there's that tiny chance that it could. And I'm representing that risk by the width of this pothole here. Um, but with influenza, you know, say you did accidentally give someone influenza from the vaccine, the impact of that would be relatively small, given that we have treatments for, uh, for flu and that you would eventually recover. And so the impact of that is the depth of the pothole here. However, with HIV, again, the probability of getting HIV from a vaccine would be absolutely teeny tiny. However, the risk, the, uh, the impact of accidentally giving someone HIV would just be way too big. Um, and so because um, HIV could be potentially with someone for the rest of their life, you know, that risk is too big. And so we can't give someone an inactivated vaccine. So if we can't take the whole virus and stick it in someone, well, why don't we just take a piece of the virus and stick that into people and make that the vaccine? You could take uh, the viruses on the um, proteins located on the surface of the virus because uh, these are the proteins that your immune system sees and recognizes. And this is actually the strategy that we use with hepatitis B. However, this works with hepatitis B because it's a, a not a very diverse virus. So say you vaccinated someone with this strain of hepatitis B. Um, this strain and this strain are pretty closely related. They're about as closely related as humans are to chimpanzees. Um, you know, they're both primates. They both have two arms, two legs. They're both kind of hairy. Uh, so they're not that different from each other. And so if you vaccinate with one protein and then later you are exposed to, you know, a different, slightly different strain, your body would still recognize it as being the same pathogen and it would know to attack it. However, HIV is a hugely diverse protein um, and two different strains of HIV can be as different from each other as a human is from a banana. So say you get vaccinated with this yellow strain of HIV and then later you're exposed to the red strain of HIV. How is your body supposed to know that that's the same pathogen and it's supposed to attack it? Um, so this problem of diversity makes it so that we can't just take any protein and stick that into people. We need to be a little bit more smart about doing that. We need to, you know, be more careful. And what we really need is we need a blueprint. We need to know, okay, if you stick this protein into someone, it'll give them a protective response. So how do we make a blueprint for a successful HIV vaccine? You know, having a blueprint is really important because say you're trying to build a skyscraper, you know, if you try and do it without a blueprint, there's no guarantee that it's going to be structurally sound. And, you know, trying to build an HIV vaccine without a blueprint is the same. We've had a lot of HIV vaccine trials that have failed. Um, and that's because oftentimes we were going in blind. Um, and so uh, if we want to have a successful HIV vaccine, we need a blueprint. Um, so how do we do this? Let's uh, do an experiment. Let's uh, say for a minute that we live in a world without any ethics. Okay, let's take everyone listening to this talk right now and let's vaccinate each and every one of you with some different HIV protein. And then we're gonna expose all of you to the virus and we'll see who gets infected and who was protected. Now this experiment would give us a lot of really useful information, it would tell us Oh, you know, if you if you vaccinate with this protein, you know, people will be protected. Um, but obviously, this is a terribly unethical experiment, and we are definitely not going to do this to people. However, it turns out that there is a place in nature where this experiment is already happening, and it's happening within moms and babies. So, moms that are HIV positive will sometimes transmit their virus to their infant but sometimes not. And it turns out that only 30% of infants will end up getting infected. They'll end up getting their mother's virus. And if you think about it, that's actually less than you would expect because infants are exposed to their mother's virus at many points. 
And the virus can be transmitted when the baby is in the womb for nine months where they share a circulatory system. It can be transmitted during childbirth, um, which is a messy process and there's exchange of fluids during that. And then it can also be transmitted through breastfeeding after uh, birth. And yet at the end of all of this, only 30% of babies will end up getting their mother's virus. This has been kind of a mystery. Um, what's protecting these babies? And we think that moms are giving their babies a secret weapon. They're giving them their antibodies. So antibodies are molecules made by the immune system that can protect us from infection. And I like to think about antibodies as being the baseball bat of the immune system. Um, and it turns out that when babies are in the womb, mothers will transfer their antibodies to their infant. And this will protect the infant during the first few months of life. So these antibodies are already swirling around inside them, ready to defend them from infection when they're exposed. And this mimics a vaccine. This is as if the baby got a vaccine and has antibodies against the virus. So this uh, gives us a really great opportunity to kind of look at, well, what kind of immunity would you need to uh, protect yourself from infection? And I'm gonna talk about um, antibodies and the different types of antibodies that we can have. Because usually people think about antibodies as being one, you know, monolithic thing, but it turns out there's different kinds. Um, and we generally kind of lump them into two categories, uh, neutralizing antibodies and non-neutralizing antibodies. So neutralizing antibodies are uh, kind of the bouncers of the immune system. So the cell is throwing a party and the virus wants in, but uh, these um, antibodies will prevent them from ever getting inside the cell. On the other hand, non-neutralizing antibodies are kind of like the cleanup crew of the immune system. So at this point, the virus has already got into the party, it's making a mess, and these antibodies can recognize the mess that the virus is making, and it will tell the immune system to come and clean up and get rid of these infected cells. And typically, the in the past, the HIV field has really only looked at neutralizing antibodies. It's only really cared about those antibodies. And I've kind of thought about non-neutralizing antibodies as being the underdogs. Um, but it turns out that there's some evidence that maybe we should be paying attention to these non-neutralizing antibodies a bit more. And so um, I've said that there have been many vaccine trials that have failed, um, but there was one vaccine trial that had partial efficacy. Um, and this was done in the, nine, in the, er, in the early 2000s. Um, and this vaccine only was about 30% effective, which is not that great, but in comparison to any other HIV that has come before or since, it's as good as we've gotten. Um, for comparison, the chickenpox vaccine is 95% effective, and that's kind of what we're aiming for here. Um, and while this vaccine didn't work, um, researchers used this as a learning opportunity. And so they went and looked at the vaccinated people and tried to understand what kind of antibodies did they have. When they looked for neutralizing antibodies, they actually found that the vaccinated people weren't making any. Instead, what they found was that if you had higher amounts of non-neutralizing antibodies, you were more likely to be um, uh, protected from infection. And this was surprising to the HIV field, and this suddenly made everybody realize, oh, maybe we should be paying attention to these antibodies more. And so my lab um, decided to study these non-neutralizing antibodies in the context of mothers and infants in Kenya. And so my lab has long-standing collaborations with some hospitals and research centers in Kenya. And we have samples from mothers and babies going back to the 90s. And the reason why these samples are special are not just because they're from moms and babies, but because they're from the 90s, this is before antiretroviral therapy was the standard of care. And so nowadays, if you're um, diagnosed with an HIV infection, you're immediately put on antiretroviral therapy. But back in the 90s, it wasn't widely available yet. And so um, what we're able to see is the development of these antibodies without antiretroviral therapy suppressing it and, and kind of um, truncating the antibody response. 
And so because nowadays all mothers will be put on antiretroviral therapy, these samples are really precious and they will never again exist. So these are um, some really great uh, sources of information that we can use. So the samples that we take from mom, we take a blood sample pre-birth, and then we take uh, these blood samples one week of life, one month, and three months, all the way out to two years, we follow the infants. And so we can see at what point do the infants acquire HIV infection, if ever. And then we can see at that time, what antibodies did those uh, infants have? And so what our lab did was we looked um, just in the babies that did get infected, um, and we tried to see, you know, what was making um, some babies do better and others' babies do worse. And so what we found was that um, if you had more non-neutralizing antibodies, as in this dark line here, uh, the babies were more likely to survive for longer. And the babies that had lower amounts of these non-neutralizing antibodies, are, as in the dotted line here, um, they didn't survive for as long. And so um, in the context of an infected baby, these antibodies are helping them. And we think that um, if you had the right non-neutralizing antibody, that it could also help the babies um, prevent uh, them from getting infected. And so the goal of my project has been to isolate some non-neutralizing antibodies from moms that didn't transmit their HIV to their infants. And so what we do is we take a blood sample and we um, individually isolate these antibodies. So how do we do that? Um, the way that this process works is you start with the blood sample and then you first separate out just exclusively the antibody producing cells. So these are the B cells. And you take all of these B cells, which you know make antibodies against a lot of different pathogens, not just HIV, and you take these B cells and you individually put them into a well of a plate. And then those B cells um, can grow up and continually pump out antibody. And then I can study the antibody and see, you know, is it HIV specific? And is it a non-neutralizing antibody? And these B cell sorts uh, result in thousands and thousands of cells to study. So it's a lot of work. Um, and in fact, sorting these cells in general is just a really labor intensive process. And my lab only does this a few times a year because it's so labor intensive. Uh, and just to give you a glimpse of what this uh, sort process is like, um, when we're doing uh, this, when we're handling these HIV infected samples, we have to wear these special suits to avoid breathing in um, the virus accidentally from the sample. And then once we take all of the B cells and we plate them, um, we have to do all of our testing and plating with a robot because, like I said, there are thousands of B cells and it's just way too much work for one human being to do. Um, and so my lab has this awesome robot to help us do these tests. Um, and I hope, you know, at the end of all of this, um, I'll come up with some really cool antibodies, some really interesting non-neutralizing antibody that potentially protected a baby from infection. Um, I haven't been able to do this process yet, and I'm sort of in, uh, in the middle of gearing up to do it, but you know, with coronavirus, I, I don't really know when I'm gonna get back into the lab and able to uh, do this B cell sort, but hopefully soon. Um, because at the end goal, you know, if we do get one of these special antibodies, I'm hoping that this can you know, yield a blueprint for a successful HIV vaccine. And I just wanna take a minute to step back and think about vaccines in general and really how great they are. Uh, you know, we used to get infected with all kinds of infectious diseases. It was incredibly common. Um, and you can see on the left here in the 1900s, we were getting all kinds of different viruses. But nowadays we're largely shielded from them. And that's mainly due to vaccines, which are arguably, you know, the greatest medical advance that we've had. Um, and, you know, I know we're in the middle of another pandemic right now, but I think it is still remarkable to think about you know, we, we fully expect um, that we're gonna have a vaccine against the coronavirus within, you know, the next couple years and we'll be able to go about our lives again. But, you know, a century ago, that was completely unthinkable. So I think we're very lucky to be able to build these vaccines. Um, and, you know, for other viruses, 
the path between discovery and vaccine deployment has been relatively straightforward. But for HIV, uh, the journey has been a lot different. It's uh, had a lot of twists and turns and setbacks along the way, but I'm still hopeful that at some point we'll make it across the finish line and we'll get an, a successful HIV vaccine. And I am hoping that my research can play some small part in getting us there. So with that, um, I wanna thank my lab, the Overbaugh lab at uh, Fred Hutch, where I'm a graduate student. And I also really wanted to thank uh, the Engage Speaker Series and this class that I've taken through UW. It has just been an awesome experience learning how to communicate science to the public. Um, and thank you all for listening and I'm looking forward to any questions. Cool. Great, thanks so much, Megan. Um, that was a really great presentation. Um, just a reminder, if you do have questions, put them in the ask a question field um, and we will get to them at the end of the program. Um, so our next speaker is Sarah Keller. Sarah is a fourth year PhD student in bioengineering, working in the lab of Dr. Mike Averku. Um, she studies the use of contrast enhanced ultrasound for cancer diagnostics and therapy. Please join me in welcoming Sarah Keller. Okay. Um, oh, shit. Uh, sorry, guys. I went ahead. No problem. All right. <laughs> okay, so thank you for the introduction. My name is Sarah, and I'm going to talk today about using sound to treat cancer. So to begin, you probably are all familiar with cancer, um, and especially with its side effects of treatment. And these include hair loss, nausea, and a weakened immune system. And actually, these are all side effects of chemotherapy. And chemotherapy drugs, and this is because chemotherapy drugs are really effective at killing cancer cells, but they also kill other cells too. So to understand this, it's useful to consider the biology of cancer. So at our core, we are composed of cells. And this is the building block of life. So we have blood cells, brain cells, muscle cells, skin cells, bone cells, cells all over. And what separates us from unicellular, be unicellular beings is that our cells um, replicate to create new cells. So, and this happens through a process of cell division where one cell divides and creates more. There are checks and balances in place in our body that ensure that, um, that cells grow correctly. So if something happens to a cell that causes it to, um, to grow abnormally, then the body knows to either destroy the cell or just make sure that it doesn't replicate into bad copies of, its, um, of itself. However, um, cancer happens when cell division is uncontrolled. So the bad cell creates more bad cells, which create more bad cells, which eventually create um, tumors, which pose a large burden on the body. And even more so when those um, cancer cells are able to metastasize into other organs. Chemotherapy drugs, on the other hand, work by either killing the cancer cells themselves or stopping new growth. And the important part about chemo drugs is that they affect all of the cells in the body that are rapidly dividing. They aren't usually targeted to any specific cancer cell. They're just injected in the body and go pretty much everywhere. And that means that side effects happen when these really toxic drugs will affect healthy cells. And the cells that they usually infect are the ones that are get are the cell, <laughs> infection is on the mind, um, are, the, are the cells that are related to the side effects that we know. So for example, um, people who are taking chemo generally have a bigger chance of infection. Um, they experience hair loss and nausea and vomiting. And this is because the cells within the blood are getting destroyed, the cells that create the hair, the cells that line the digestive tract. So my research involves trying to answer the question if we what if we can control where drugs go? And there are tons of ways of doing it, but the way that we have been studying is using ultrasound. So you may have heard of ultrasound. A quick um, look at ultrasound Google images shows that um, pretty much, so we've got babies and babies, 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 babies. And so pretty much ultrasound is known for its very useful imaging of prenatal infants. Um, but it's also used for many other applications, including cardiac imaging, um, abdominal imaging, as well as oncology purposes. So ultrasound is um, a way of imaging the body by using literally just sound. And it allows us to peek inside of the body in a way that's truly non-invasive and very safe. So 
at its very core, ultrasound is sound, and sound is a wave. And waves are defined by their width and their height. So we'll talk about the width first. So if you can see here between the two um, dashed lines, this is one repeating unit of a wave. And it um, happens within one period, and we can call this one cycle. So the frequency of sound is the number of periods or cycles that happen within a second. So if we can imagine doubling the number of cycles that happen within this period, like in the dashed gray line, this wave would have double the frequency. Frequency is measured in hertz, or one over seconds. So the bigger, so the, bigger the frequency in hertz, the more cycles that happen within a given period of time. Ultrasound is also, or sound, I guess, is also defined by its amplitude. And in sound, the amplitude is pressure. And this might be a little bit confusing, but if you think about the way that we perceive sound, um, it's actually the sound pressure waves that hit our eardrums and cause it to vibrate, and then that sends signals to our brain that we then interpret. Um, another maybe easier way of understanding this is that if you go to a rock concert and you're standing right by the speakers, you can really feel the bass notes vibrating your entire body, um, and probably you're getting hearing damage then. Um, but it's useful to think of sound both as pressure waves as well as defined by a specific frequency. And the sound spectrum uh, goes from low frequency to high frequency. And so the frequencies that we can hear run from 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz. So that would be 20 cycles per second to 20,000 cycles per second. Or if you're like me, maybe 17,000 seconds cycles per second. And yes, I've measured it. Um, but anything beyond 20 kilohertz is what's known as ultrasound. And this is sound that is at a high enough frequency that our human ear cannot hear it. And diagnostic imaging is generally between one megahertz to 20 megahertz. And that's one million cycles per second to 20 million cycles per second. So not anything that we can hear, but it's used to create images. So ultrasound, so creating ultrasound images is similar to how a bat um, senses its prey by using echolocation. It sends out some sort of wave, it pings against its prey that gets sent back to it, and then it knows exactly where it is. An ultrasound image is made in a very similar way. So um, an ultrasound probe or a transducer, um, the things that are usually coated with gel and placed against the body, um, are used to send the sound waves. So to create an image, you send a pulse, and it hits some sort of reflection. And the reflection could be any sort of deviation of tissue within the body. So for example, in this image of the baby, maybe it's the baby's skull that is reflecting sound. Sound gets reflected back, and the time that it takes for sound to get reflected back tells us exactly where it's happening. So just like the bat is sending sound waves to figure out where its prey is, we're also sending sound waves and receiving them to know where these tissue changes happen within the body. And this happens along all of the um, uh, transverse uh, areas within this image. The standard ultrasound, what I just explained, is really useful for looking at anatomy. So in this image, we can see um, a liver, and we can see um, that it has kind of a homogeneous nature. It's There's some stuff below it that is also anatomical, but we can't really see anything beyond its basic morphology. There's a special kind of ultrasound called contrast-enhanced ultrasound, which is used to image tiny injected particles or tiny particles that are injected into the body to provide an extra boost of, of signal. And the, um, what we're imaging here is something that shows a little bit more about what's going on within this picture. And we can see in the upper right-hand corner, there's an area that's not receiving blood flow. And in this case, um, this is actually a tumor. So we can delineate between areas that are healthy and areas that are not healthy based on how we can see the contrast washing in and washing out. And seeing blood flow allows us to get more information about what's going on beyond just anatomical morphology. So contrast-enhanced ultrasound images something called microbubbles. And microbubbles are a gas core surrounded by a fatty layer, just like normal bubbles, except that they're stable in blood circulation and super small. So microbubbles are about the same size as red blood cells, or at least on the same order of magnitude which means that they go wherever red blood cells go. So they're a great way of looking at blood flow within the body in real time. Um, and it's, and microbubbles are um, affected by ultrasound based on their properties. So if you can remember, sound is a wave of positive and negative pressure and bubbles also respond to this positive and negative pressure. So 
at ambient, so zero pressure, the bubble is at its normal radius. If we increase the pressure around, around the bubble, it gets smaller. Then it gets back to its normal size. And then if we can imagine decreasing the pressure around the bubble, it gets a lot bigger. And then back to normal size. So this alternating positive or positive and negative pressure causes alternating contraction and expansion of the bubble. And this results in an oscillation of the bubble. And this oscillation generates sound that can be um, heard, heard by the ultrasound probe. So let's go back to how we create sound images. So in standard ultrasound, we send a pulse, it hits some sort of reflection, and we receive a pulse. So I'm gonna play a note and hopefully this can be heard. So if you can imagine sending an A note, you are also receiving that same A note with standard ultrasound. Contrast enhanced ultrasound sends a pulse, causes a microbubble to oscillate, and then um, receives a distorted version of that pulse. So if you can imagine, you're sending the A note, and then you're, oh no, you're receiving that A note, you're also receiving a harmonic of the A note, and then a harmonic of that. So you're receiving not only the original frequency that you're sending, but also harmonics of that frequency, which are just, if you're sending um, F, you're receiving two times F and three times F. And we can isolate any individual component that's unique to the contrast um, or to the bubble signature, so maybe this uh, mid A note, and create an image that's solely microbubble signal, and therefore it's solely microvascular signal. And this can allow both information or both really high resolution um, images like this one, or like I showed previously, some functional information about where blood is going and where it's not. And this is really useful and used clinically to diagnose specific types of um, tumor lesions. So microbubbles are also really useful. So not only are microbubbles used for imaging, but they also create tiny mechanical forces within the body. And these include the oscillation of the bubble itself, implosion of the bubble, so if, um, which means destruction of the bubble, basically, and then movement of the bubble, so it gets actually pushed by ultrasound. And all of these, oh, sorry. So oscillation of the bubble we can think of as, if you recall before, the positive and negative pressure waves cause the bubble to expand and contract and expand and contract in a method that's fairly stable. And this is what's generally used for imaging because it gives off well-defined characteristics and those are easily able to be filtered and created into an image. Um, at really high pressures, so if you like really ramp up the intensity of your sound, or I guess the um, amplitude of your sound, then you can cause actual bubble collapse and really violent events that cause um, really interesting and, and often violent um, uh, mechanical forces to happen around it. And this is what's known as implosion. It, under ultrasound pressure, microbubbles can also um, be moved by, uh, or under ultrasound pressure, microbubbles can also be moved. So in this example, um, ultrasound is shooting from below and it's causing the microbubbles in this chamber to both um, destroy and implode at the bottom, but also be propagated towards the top of the chamber. And this is really interesting because it means that not only are we causing the initial bubble um, uh, physics to happen, so the, the oscillation and implosion, but we're also able to translate exactly where the bubbles go. And this can create an, ex, an even more violent force on wherever we're trying to, to exact forces on, exert forces on. So oscillation, movement, and destruction and implosion can all be used in the body in order to weaken the barriers that exist between the bloodstream and cancer cells. So the bubble oscillating next to the vascular wall or bubbles getting pushed towards the vascular wall or bubbles literally getting so big that they implode on themselves can all exist these tiny mechanical forces that all exist to penetrate these, um, these barriers and get into tumor areas. So controlling microbubble oscillations can allow us to control drug delivery. But how can we control where it happens? So ultrasound, like light can also be focused in a way like light can be focused through a lens. So in this image, we see a pressure field of the ultrasound signal. And this is what's called focused ultrasound. So the areas that are dark and blue are areas of low pressure, where the areas that are yellow are areas of high pressure. And as you can see, this really small focal region happens in a very discrete area within the body that can be accessed from outside of the body. 
And so this means that this process is fully non-invasive and it allows us to control microbubble oscillation and movement in very specific locations. So microbubbles not only provide contrast for imaging, so it allows us to see the targets that we're trying to affect, but they can also provide localized mechanical forces for drug delivery. So that's the oscillation, the movement, and the destruction and implosion that can all be focused within a specific area um, uh, using focused ultrasound. And this is all follows under, falls under the umbrella of image-guided drug delivery, in which we use ultrasound imaging to both find where we want to apply our therapy, and then we can actually do the therapy with the same device. So this is really important because more drug going to the cancer cells means less drug going to healthy cells. And that both could allow us to reduce the amount of dose of the toxic chemical toxic um, drugs that we're giving to people and therefore reduce side effects or cause a better um, better targeting and therefore higher drug uptake in the specific areas that we're trying to affect. So my research is um, adapting clinical systems and microbubbles to perform image-guided drug delivery. So generally, um, focused ultrasound is is done using really specific systems that are not necessarily found in clinics. But what I'm trying to do is use um, clinically available tools, such as um, this uh, Philips system and um, cardiac probe um, that's used generally for, um, for depth imaging. So looking at the heart or looking at the uh, abdomen. And we're trying to create it into something that's not only used for imaging, but also used for focused um, ultrasound therapy, as well as using clinically available reagents. So um, clinically available microbubbles. And we think that adapting things that are already available in clinics can make it possible to translate this um, practice um, to clinical practice. So in summary, um, ultrasound is a super exciting cancer therapy. Um, it allows image guidance for real-time targeting so we can see exactly where we're trying to apply our therapy and do it in exactly that location. Um, it's non-invasive, so all of this can happen from, without, from outside of the body and it can be incorporated in tools that are already available in clinics. Um, and I don't have a slide for this, but um, I think people in my lab are watching. So thank you for your help and thank you um, Town Hall and Engage for letting me be part of this program. Thanks. Yeah, thank you so much, Sarah. Uh, really helpful visuals with that one. I think that was really great. I learned a lot. Um, just a reminder that we're going to be moving into our final speaker. Um, again, if you have questions, feel free to put them in the question field. Um, so our final speaker is Shervin Saba. Shervin is a physics PhD student at the University of Washington. Shervin studies how to control the flow of light by forecasting its future state, merging methods from computational physics photonics, and machine learning. Please join me in welcoming Shervin Saba. Thank you for the kind welcome. Um, so hi, my name is Shervin. Uh, I'm a physics PhD student. We just got that intro. So I'd like to talk to you about taming lasers in the wild sky. Uh, it's about communicating with one another. That's the focus of this talk, but we're doing it with lasers. Uh, so let me actually start my timer to roll into this. And We'll get moving. Okay. So we all know we have this intrinsic need to connect with one another. Uh, it's been increasingly uh, prevalent on my mind. It's been weighing on me because we're social distancing for this last month or two. And while I've been physically apart from people, I've actually felt, I don't know, emotionally close. And it's due to the advances we've made in modern communication systems. Um, just the other day, I was talking video conferencing with a bunch of my goofball friends, and we were bonding, and we're thousands of miles apart. So how can we make this better? How can we keep moving to, through a world which pushes our communication technologies, pushes the way we move into an internet of things? I propose we do so via lasers. So this is a story where classified government research, uh, physicists in, a physicist in Seattle, and a path towards secure global communications, they all come together. Uh, I believe we need to tame the laser. And if we do so, we can get a lot of worldwide connectivity. This image is actually from uh, Tesla's Starlink, which proposes to provide internet continuously, whether you're on top of Everest or in 
I don't know, Salt Lake City. But before we get into that, we're talking about light. I'm saying it's a medium for communication, but what exactly is light? When, when you think of light, you may think of colors. I mean, I certainly do. I think of the reds and greens and yellows. Uh, when physicists and engineers, when we discuss light, we think of it as a set of frequencies. So light is a particle, a photon, and it's also a wave. And that wave, when it moves through space, it uh, repeats different rates. So if a wave passes by you really quickly, it has a really high frequency. And if a wave passes by you really slowly every second, then it's a low frequency. And that matches to the wavelength of that wave itself. So we've given names to different uh, sizes or wavelengths of light. Radio waves have these really, really long wavelengths. Uh, that means they pass by you not so frequently. Uh, whereas microwaves are more frequent, but still uh, fairly long wavelengths. And when you move up into x-rays, those are very frequently moving by you. Those are very energetic waves of light. The visible spectrum, is, it's a really tiny sliver of this. So red light is around 700 nanometers in length. That means roughly 200 red light waves can fit inside the width of a human hair. Um, and then it moves up through blue and ultraviolet and past that we no longer associate with the color. So we should think of light in terms of these frequencies. Now, radio waves, you're familiar with that because you have a car radio, for instance. And indeed, that antenna is receiving these long uh, light waves. Radio waves are so long they can pass over mountains and buildings relatively unobstructed. That made them really great for communications for the last 100 years. And we move towards microwaves, which are shorter wavelengths. These still can move around buildings, but they deflect off things eventually. These are what your cell phones receive from cell, from cell towers. We're going to make a case for lasers in a second, but we should ask ourselves, how does light even transmit that information? This is an artistic photograph of fiber optic cables. Past 10 years have been great for fiber optics. We've been laying them through the ground, and they've been quite literally pumping information via light to your computer. So there's these glass tubes. We see them in the top left. They're usually not splayed out like that. They're usually in a wire in the earth. And if you shine light, laser light typically through them, it bounces through and ends up at its final destination. It can travel hundreds of kilometers unobstructed. When it, re when it reaches your ethernet cable or your computer, it's converted to an electrical signal. And then you see that as uh, memes probably or YouTube videos or video conferences with your friends. So how do the light pulses even encode info? Well, let's envision a wave, a light wave, moving in time to the right. And we'll, we're going to track its intensity, so how bright it is. If we break up this wave into different height levels, different intensity levels, we can assign to each level of brightness a number. For instance, the lowest level we can call 0, the next one 1. Afterwards, we can call the next uh, most intense uh, level 2. But because computers process things in binary using only zeros and ones, the number two is written as uh, 10, and number three is written as 11. Regardless, we can encode light in bits, or we can use uh, its brightness to encode information in bits. And that gets piped through an optical fiber, that's what this cartoon is supposed to be, to your home, and you can uh, transfer information. So where does the laser fit into this? And why would we want to control it? Uh, when we think of lasers, we think of science fiction, perhaps, or, you know, cats, entertainment, pointing at things, uh, energy weapons, for instance. But they have lots of applications, a myriad of applications. They're found everywhere in the industry for etching and engraving. They're used in the entertainment industry for their beauty. They're used in med medical practices. Uh, Sarah's talk actually mentioned that, I believe, at some point. Um, and cosmetics. But also, the last time you probably used a laser was at the grocery store uh, when scanned the barcode. It also might have been the last time you left your house in recent times. So we have this man to thank for the laser almost exactly 60 years ago to this day. This is Ted Maimon, and he's holding a Ruby laser. Laser itself is an acronym. It stands for light amplification by stimulated emission of radiation. And here, radiation means light. It has nothing to do with radioactivity. 
That's a mouthful. So we can break it down by exploring that same laser that Ted Maimon was holding. So this is a, this is a cross section of a ruby laser. Uh, we see a synthetic ruby crystal sitting in the middle. Synthetic because rubies are kind of pricey. This is called our gain medium. And what we should ask what we're gaining. Well, the goal is light amplification. We want to create more light, amplify it. We want to gain more photons or light particles. And we do so with this bulb, this light bulb that's wrapped around the crystal and its power source on the right-hand side. So we actually inject energy into the system. And when that, when that light bulb flashes, the electrons in the crystal, they get stimulated, which means they start themselves releasing more light and more light and more light. And we enclose the ruby crystal in two mirrors. So why would we do this? Well, if that ruby crystal is starting to emit light and it's trapped between mirrors, it's going to be bouncing back and forth and stimulating more light. So it just grows in there until it finally gets emitted out of the left-hand mirror, which is a kind of see-through mirror. It's a half mirror. That gets us the radiation, which is our laser beam. And this is, in essence, how a laser works. So why is a laser so unique? All of those light particles that just came out, they're completely aligned. They're almost the same. They're the same color. They're the same frequency, and they have other similar properties that engineers really like to use. And we can use them for our systems. So let's compare them to those radio and microwaves. Uh, radio and microwave frequencies are great. I mean, we use them for communications all the time. Uh, but they have their limitations. So radio waves are very long. Meaning if, if by analogy, you were to write a message using size 72 point font, that's like on one piece of paper, that's kind of like a radio wave. You try to send information in size 72 point font and it will take a long time to transfer it. Versus a microwave is a shorter wavelength, uh, which means it passes by more frequently. And if pulses pass by more frequently, we can put more information in a pulse, or sorry, we can uh, measure more information per second uh, as compared to a longer wavelength. So it's like 10 point font versus 72 point font. Lasers are even higher on the frequency spectrum. This means they have a larger bandwidth. You may have heard that term thrown around. Because they have a higher frequency, uh, you can embed so much more information per second, which means we can communicate clearer it's led to us having these seamless Zoom calls and Skype calls and uh, crowdcasts. And there's different types of lasers, but they pretty much all fit in to the infrared, visible, and ultraviolet frequencies. So that ruby laser uh, that was originally made is a red color. It's a complete coincidence, ruby and red. And that other crystal is a, it's a synthetic garnet stone that's pictured there. That's a nice green color. And that's actually what uh, we look at in some of our experiments. There's another advantage, point-to-point -point security. So radio microwaves spread out in all directions. However, lasers are narrow beams. They travel uh, pretty much to their destination, which makes it difficult to eavesdrop on. Furthermore, uh, something I really love to get into, I don't have time for it here, but for quantum communications, lasers are essential. They're absolutely essential to create a quantum bit. So what is a bit, a normal bit? Bits are the piece of information that we send on our computers currently. Classical bits are always visible when you send them. Uh, and even though I can see them in theory, if I really tried or a hacker really tried, they're still encrypted. So your information is fairly secure, as secure as encryption. Quantum bits are a little bit different. They're entangled light particles. So these light particles have this interesting property that they become tamper-proof. And in order to create quantum bits for quantum security communications, uh, lasers are absolutely necessary. So what's our challenge? What's our challenge with getting a more laser-based communication out there? And our challenge is that lasers are hard to tame in the sky. We have them in fiber optic cables. Uh, they're actually used to communicate between satellites in outer space where the air is thin. But in the sky itself, we have a rough time. This picture is really awesome. 
this person standing there with like it looks like two like lightsabers they're ready to duel but those laser beams aren't completely going to their destination that's because you can see them so that air must be filled with pollen or dust or something similar so the laser shines off to the side so not all the lights going to its destination and it, whatever gets there has moved through particles in the air and the wave front the front each cross section of the wave has become distorted a bit okay so we aim high in our research we're looking for the most turbulent air and that exists between aircraft to aircraft communications uh, so i have some sensitive military data that i'm not supposed to show you no it's cool so that's not sensitive data uh, although i work with some classified information that i shouldn't talk about this is actually the aero optics uh, airborne lab at notre dame it's two aircraft uh one sends a beam out, Ooh, it's called the AAOLT. T is for transonic because these fly near the speed of sound. One has a laser turret that shines a beam and the other one has a receiver turret on its end. And we use this airborne experiment to uh, really investigate how a beam is affected uh, by turbulent air, by motions in the sky. Also, the turret looks a lot like R2-D2. It's just it's splendid look at that <laughs> all right when the aircraft is moving forward through the air the airflow around this dome-shaped cylinder wraps around the top and when it hits the back the air starts to fold in on itself this is what we mean by turbulent flow it's a coincidence of both the geometry of this turret and also how fast the aircraft is moving through the air and how high up it is. So these vortices that form, some of them have fun names, like this necklace one that wraps around the bottom or these horn-shaped ones. Uh, these cause the beam, the wavefront, to be distorted. So if we picture the aircraft going forward, we're going to define something called a look-back parameter, which means if the laser beam is pointed forward or pointing backwards. And we're going to investigate the optical path difference, which is uh, how correct the wave front is. We want it to be zero. So when it's looking forward, uh, the optical path difference is pretty low. It's not that turbulent. But if we look back, we hit turbulent air, and the wave front gets distorted. What do you think happens if we look into those turbulent horns? It gets even worse. We can't send information like that. And if we master this, we can master so much more laser communication. So on board the receiver craft, we have this array of sensors um, that can detect if the wavefront is flat or not. It's like our friend on the top. If there's a flat wavefront, these dots would not be moving. But if it's a distorted wavefront with rough surfaces, we get jitters like this. So now we say, if only we could predict the future. Because if we could, we can, do a we can do a good trick to correct our beam. We could predict what the distorted wave would be. And then we could beam out its mirror image. So this is the opposite wave. And when we beam out the mirror image, it still hits the turbulent air. However, however, the outgoing beam is corrected. So we bend it back into shape. So can we predict the future? And we say, yes, this is what I work on. Predictive forecasting. Um, we all, you and I, are all forecasters of the future. Life is a series of snapshots in time. And honestly, you couldn't drive to work if you couldn't predict how the nearby drivers were acting. So we presume that computers can do the same thing. For instance, if we look at this example, we see this pool player. They're trying to jump the cue ball, the white ball, over the dark ball, hit the yellow one, and pocket it. And we see they make the jump in the second frame. Now, can you predict if they hit the yellow ball? Probably not. It's not enough information. But can you tell me what's moving? And you can. The man in red's moving. The cue is moving. The cue ball is moving. These are the actors in our play. You can also tell me what's not moving. The ball that's going to be jumped over, you can predict that. The background's not moving. 
It's tough to know what happens to the yellow ball, but with more snapshots, we can get closer and closer to a prediction. And here we see it's getting pretty close. Uh, you can go to the YouTuber's channel and see if they make it. We call these actors deciding what is actually moving in our data, our dynamical modes. And we do the same thing for our wavefront data. We can map those distortions that we saw in a ring onto a square grid because it becomes easier to work with and then build a predictor from it. Meaning we take every single snapshot and we arrange it in columns. And when we process this information, we try to see what characteristics does it have? Like here we see this big hump moving across. Perhaps that keeps repeating. And if it does, we can use it to predict the future by a little bit. We do this for every single angle that the laser can look at. So each row here represents an angle that the, that the beam can be directed at and the different turbulent dynamical modes that it can see. With all of these modes, we can then reconstruct the wave and do our little trick where we correct our wavefront. Dynamical mode decomposition, the name of this technique, is what is used to predict a little bit in the future. And I think that this is our way to really tame uh, a laser in the sky. So I, what I want you to go and tell your friends, first of all, is that light is communication. I mean, the, in the modern age, pretty much all of our communication technologies are using some form of light. And lasers are really unique in the type of light that they generate. So unique that they are superior in terms of data rates and in terms of security and in terms of what sort of physics we can do, like the quantum security I brought up before. And also, we can predict the future and control it somewhat. And we do so by looking at snapshots in time and seeing what are the essential modes that can propagate forward. So that's our shot at taming lasers in the skies. Uh, I'd like to thank you all for your attention. I'd also like to thank Candice, Josh, Ginny, Town Hall Seattle, everyone at UW Engage. Thank you so much. And my advisors, Nathan, Steve, and AFRL, my mentors there. So let me know what questions you have. Thanks. All right, excellent. Thanks so much, Sherman. Um, this is my third time hosting these, and I just have to say that I learn something every time. It's kind of amazing. So they're uh, everyone's doing really great. Tonight is great. Um, so I'm going to start asking questions. We're going to go um, from Megan to Sarah to Shervin. Um, so again, put your questions in the ask a question field and we'll get to them. So um, let's start with Megan. Okay. So this first question um, is, let's see, I'm, gonna, I'm probably going to say this name wrong, um, Ani Rood. Um, so if, if the mother has antibodies, then why would she still have the infection? Yeah, so this is due to uh, something which I didn't have time to talk about, which uh, one of the other reasons why HIV is so hard to make a vaccine against is because it can hide really well from the immune system. So initially, when you're infected, it will go around and infect new cells, but then it will lie dormant for a long time. It'll integrate into your cells and then your body can't tell which cells are infected and which are not because it's silent at that point. Um, and so these, you know, once a person gets infected and that's established, it's too late. Like these antibodies, they can go and try and find where the virus is, but if it's hiding already within the cells, then it's too late. So the best that we can hope for is that these antibodies could help prevent infection uh, from establishing in the first place. So um, once an infection is established, though, these antibodies can't uh, get rid of it, which is why people don't recover from HIV. You'll have it for the rest of your life. Yeah. OK, um, this question is from Cassidy. Do mothers give the antibodies to the babies, but not the ability to make them? So if the antibodies eventually disappear from the baby's immune system, would it be possible for them to contract the virus from the mother later on? So yes, so um, in the womb, the mom will transfer her antibodies to her infant. And these uh, antibodies, antibodies are molecules that can stick around for many months, but eventually they will go away. Um, and that's by design. I mean, antibodies, they help you out during the first few months of life, but then your own immune system kicks in. Um, but 
uh, what you really need if you want to continuously make antibodies is you need the B cells. And the B cells are the ones that continuously pump out antibody. Um, and so the mothers aren't giving their babies B cells. They're just giving them the antibodies. So, um, yeah. And then the second part of the question was, um, oh, I can't remember. Well, it was kind of just a uh, sort of reiteration. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah. But um, the, so the second part was, um, so if the antibodies eventually disappear from the baby's immune system, would it be possible for them to contract the virus a month later? Yeah. So, um, yeah, as long as those antibodies are around, you would be protected. But again, they'll, they'll last a few months and then they'll go away. And once they get below a certain level, if you're being continuously exposed to the virus, yes, you could pick it up again. So say those antibodies disappear and you're breastfeeding still, then the virus could be transmitted then. Yeah. Okay. Um, this next question is from Laurel. How many of these precious samples do you have? How many mothers and babies were able to participate? And she wanted to say that that is also awesome. <laughs> Great. <laughs> yeah, it was awesome that they agreed to participate. Um, uh, so uh, from this particular study back in the 90s, um, we had, I don't know the exact number, but I think it's a couple hundred mother infant pairs were enrolled. Um, and when we get samples from these mothers, we get several, um, several tubes worth of samples. Um, and so these have been sitting in freezers for like 30 years at this point. Um, they've flown all the way from Kenya and they're sitting in freezers here in Seattle, which is pretty cool. Um, but yeah, there's a few hundred mothers and infants that were enrolled in this study. And it is almost getting to the point that, you know, we're getting for some of these mothers and some of these samples, we're getting down to the last bits of it. And, you know, once these samples are gone, that's it really. So yeah, they are pretty precious samples. Uh, this question is from Leslie. Is the number of antibodies known or are they still being discovered? Um, the ratio of neutralizing to non-neutralizing antibodies. Um, okay, that's a bit of a complicated question. So uh, the second part, so um, every virus is different in the number of no neutralizing versus non-neutralizing antibodies that you'll get. And it also depends on the person. Um, but it's not really always known. There are, there do tend to be more non-neutralizing antibodies than neutralizing antibodies and not all of the non-neutralizing antibodies are helpful. Um, sometimes they can be against, uh, you know, a HIV virus goes through several different like life cycles. Um, the molecule that it targets can shift and change. And um, sometimes it kind of targets uh, non-viable forms of the virus and uh, those antibodies are not helpful because uh, it's not gonna help point the immune system towards um, an active HIV infection. So um, non-neutralizing antibodies are usually more abundant than the neutralizing antibodies. Um, but again, that differs depending on the virus that you're looking at. So, uh, yeah, and is the number of, so there's, there's a certain number of targets on the HIV envelope protein, which is the surface protein, and there's, some well characterized sites like oh you know if you have a molecule there's antibodies that target this site and there's antibodies that target this site and that that's been pretty much mapped out right now um we we're at the point where we know um all the different targets of different antibodies for hiv at least it's a very well studied in a uh, virus mm. yeah okay and then i just actually had a couple questions um mm -hmm. is there a standard for how effective a vaccine has to be in order for it to begin to be widely used? Yeah, so again, that depends on the virus. If you're desperate for something to work, I, I'm sure the, sta the standards would be a bit lower, but generally what you're looking for is enough, uh, a virus that would stimulate enough immunity to um, start building up herd immunity. Um, and so there's no hard cutoff, but generally you're kind of aiming for like 90%-ish, uh, uh, effectiveness, and we're pretty far from that right now with HIV, but a lot of our other vaccines get about about close to 90% um, effectiveness. So um, you don't want to, yeah, you don't want to give someone a, a vaccine that doesn't really work. Um, that wouldn't be helpful in the long term. So, yeah. Great. Well, thank you so much. Um, I learned a lot from your presentation. Thanks. Yeah. Um, so we're going to uh, move on to Sarah. 
Um, so first one, um, again, is from Anirudh. Uh, what are the micro bubbles made of? Um, so generally speaking, micro bubbles are made of a lipid or a fat, fatty um, shell, and then a slightly heavy but inert gas on the inside. So I actually make my own micro bubbles um, in lab, and we put a combination of um, two lipids actually on the outside and then um, a perfluorocarbon on the inside. Um, but there are a lot of different formulations that um, are being are both clinically available and being studied. So um, you can make them out of polymer shells or um, protein shells. And there's also a lot of research into um, kind of different phases of the internal core. So you can have a lipid, or sorry, a liquid internal core that will spontaneously vaporize into a gas. So it's a really exciting um, actually area of the field, but generally speaking, lipid shell and um, inert but heavy gas uh, core. Um, and you mentioned the uh, one of the things that can happen to a micro bubble is that it implodes. Um, what happens mm -hmm. when what what happens to the body when that happens? What's the effect of an imploding micro bubble? So, I guess I mean if if your bubble destroys, it will eventually just be cleared out by your circulation. So it'll be cleared out by the kidneys. Um, but if you're actually trying to cause um, some sort of effect, um, usually um, the more drastic uh, types of bubble implosion events happen at really high pressures and really high intensities of ultrasound. And that wouldn't necessarily be happening during imaging, um, but only during therapy. Um, but otherwise, yeah, the bubble, either it, it'll be destroyed by ultrasound or it will eventually dissolve and then be cleared out by the kidneys. Um, yeah. Okay. So if it, if it was happening to like a lot of them though, that would be. So like yeah, the um, there actually is some debate on um, the potential for. I mean, not really debate on the potential for damage from from micro bubbles under imaging frequencies, but there have been studies of people showing that they can cause therapeutic effect um, just by destroying bubbles at pretty low um, pressures. But for pretty much all studies that I've seen that seem um, legit, like there hasn't been any real damage that occurs from micro bubbles imploding just under normal like ultrasound pressures. Um, it's only when you like really increase the pressure and cause a really um, dramatic event that you see something happening. Okay. Um. Is it accurate to say that this new sort of procedure that you're studying is like using sound as um, a, like a scalpel? Yeah, um, it's kind of so. Well, I guess the what I'm proposing is um, not quite a scalpel. It's not quite that um, um, damaging because we're just trying to oscillate bubbles to push things beyond um, blood vessels. But there are clinically approved practices for doing um, high intensity focused ultrasound for tissue ablation, in which case it would be kind of more like a scalpel. And actually that's approved for um, uh, ablating uh, uterine fibroids. Um, it's being investigated in many other types of cancer as well as um, some other applications, for example, in the brain. Um, yeah. Great. All right. Um, thank you so much. That is pretty uh, important work. Um, okay, and lastly, we're going to move to Shervin. Um, so this question is from Clement. Um, how long of a time frame are you talking about? Um, also, for laser communications, do you have to know the location of your receiver to know where to aim? Okay, so for the receiver, yes, absolutely. You would need to know where it's located. Um, that's kind of a double-edged sword for laser communications. It's fairly point-to-point, -point, so that gives a lot of security, but when you compare it to radio microwave, uh, you don't really have to aim, you just broadcast the signal. Um, for the time frame, I'm really glad you asked that. Uh, the sampling that was being done on those crafts was tens to 20, 10 to 20,000 times per second. And it seemed debatable, debatable if that's fast enough. So the wave front, the, the wave front changes extremely quickly, and we need to correct that. Um, 
it changes so quickly that the latency in all of the electronic systems that would help correct it, uh, that even becomes a bottleneck in the process. Um, the big challenge here is that turbulence is a really uh, nonlinear system. Turbulence is really hard. It's tough to predict what's going to happen next. So when we were talking about uh, stacking different snapshots in time, there's a little bit more to that. We can stack multiple snapshots at once um, to try to find try to find those dynamic modes that relate between them. Uh, so we got to do it very quickly, and we need to find out the theme of that film strip uh, in order to be able to correct it. Cool. OK. So thanks for the question. Yeah. Um, so this next one is from Anup. Um, for airplanes flying in close proximity where messages can be delivered practically instantaneously by all means of radiation, what is the benefit of using lasers over radio waves? Yo, what's up, Anoop? Um, it is, it's not beneficial. So the laboratory that we have, that we look at, those two aircrafts, um, that's used to study the dynamics that are formed by laser beam propagation through turbulent air. Uh, where it would be really useful would be laser to ground communication, for instance. Or actually in cases of plane to plane communication where you don't want any outgoing signal to possibly go anywhere else. So you would have to aim between those two crafts and that's a very secure link. Um, yes, so the benefit would be we are, we are looking to study in that realm. We're not so much looking uh, to transmit between close crafts. Okay. Um, I'm still reeling a little bit from your point that laser is an acronym. That's like really blowing my mind. I had no idea. <laughs> it's a mouthful too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, well, that is it. Thank you all so much. Um, this has been a really great evening. Um, Thank you all also for watching. Um, if you're interested, uh, we are having our fourth uh, out of the five uh, in the series for the UW Engage next week. Um, and if you're interested in more town hall content in general, you can follow us on this Crowdcast channel by clicking the follow button in the upper right corner. Um, thank you all so much again. Thanks to uh, Megan, Sarah, and Shervin, and have a great night, everybody.